Hello, B-Sides DFW. My name is Andy Rainmaker Thompson, and we're gonna get started with the uh, track one today. Um, gotta give you a, a fair warning. This has got some explicit language, so if that is a trigger to you, uh, check out the other tracks. They've got some fantastic content throughout the day here. So let's get started. The title of my uh, talk is Tales from the Trenches, Learning from the Misery of Others. But in reality, we're gonna call it what it is. Confessions of Shitty Sysadmins. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Again, my name's Andy. Uh, I have a very interesting job. I am a researcher, an advisor, and an evangelist with CyberArk Software, so we do privileged identity management. I have a Bachelor of Science from uh, the University of Texas at Arlington in Management Information Systems. I have a, a, a host of different uh, certifications, which we'll talk about shortly. And uh, I, again, I'm a very active member in the Dallas hacking community. Uh, between DC214, DHA, NTX, uh, NTX ISSA, ISC squared, you name it, and uh, I, I'm probably there. Uh, but what I'm known for mostly is that I am what's called a travel hacker. Uh, my wife and I, we travel all over the world on a shoestring budget. So if you want to learn more about that, come find me on Discord and we can chat. But beyond all that, I was once a shitty sysadmin. But before I was a shitty sysadmin, I was a shitty help desk person. Uh, I worked as a help desk agent, funny enough, about a mile down the road here in Plano, and that's really where I got my uh, my foot, or I got started in my career, the foot in the door. And so that's where our story begins, and it really starts with passwords. Um, as part of my job, we were expected to reset the user's passwords. In order to validate their identity, we had to ask them a secret question. Now. What was interesting about this circumstance was that the users got to pick their own questions. So we had some funny ones, which I'll share with you today. The first one was a guy who decided to be cheeky and pretend that he couldn't hear. So he kept having the person ask the question over and over and over again. You know what that question was? Who's your daddy? Yes. So that poor, poor person on the help desk side, often it was me, would have to shout, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And the answer, me, yes. The next guy, this one was a bit of a pervy guy, but uh, he had probably one of the most uh, creative secret questions. Uh, the question was, what are you wearing right now? And the answer, quite correctly, was, that's totally inappropriate. <laughs> so with that said, we're gonna get started with what I call the TLA section of today's presentation. TLA stands for three letter acronyms. So again, take notes because there will be a quiz. All right, so the first of our TLAs is SLA. Does anybody know what SLA stands for? Well, you in the back are correct. It is service level agreement. This is the uh, ratio or whatever numbers main, you have to maintain to basically meet your contractual obligations. This is a very common uh, statistic in help desks, MSPs, you name it. Uh, the second of our S, uh, TLAs was our FCR. This was the SLA which we were graded by. I know lots of TLAs, folks. But FCR stands for First Call Resolution. Now, what do you think is an appropriate FCR uh, percentage for an entry-level help desk agent? Like having to resolve the call on that very first, the, resolve the issue on the very first call. Would it be 50%? Man, that's, that's a lot, right? 40%? No. It was actually 90%. We had to resolve 9 out of 10 every calls. Otherwise, we weren't really doing our job, supposedly. Which, again, breeds discontent. <laughs> so as I worked up the, the ladder, I became a, a junior, a senior. Ultimately, I progressed to the world of being a systems administrator. This is where I met Sean Garnish. Sean was my... Uh, my tutor and my, uh, my, my senior superior uh, employee that worked with me. Uh, he happened to have stage four multiple myeloma cancer and I was hired to replace a living dead man. It's a very awkward situation, but Sean was an awesome, awesome teacher and he taught me a lot of things. The one thing that I want to share with you today is the three envelope rule. This one lesson has saved my career and by the time I'm done with today's presentation, I'm gonna share that lesson with you. So 
As I progressed in my career, I joined a large enterprise organization and a large IT organization. And as you can see, regardless of what organization or what uh, role you had within an IT organization, systems administrators are often met with a certain amount of um, ill will, if you may. I don't know. They seem to think that we uh, happen to say no and block access a lot, right? Well, if you're familiar with this XKCD comic, you'll see that sysadmins aren't mean. They're just concerned about one thing and one thing alone. What is that thing? Well, it's uptime, right? Uh, many people think that we're doing a glorious, glamorous job, but in reality, we're just trying to keep this ship afloat. Because are you familiar with the CIA triad? This is the this is like a CISSP question, folks. This is the fundamental tenets of IT and security. For security to exist, we have to have three things. What are they? CIA: confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now that's the CIA triad specific to security. As a systems administrator, I had a different triad altogether, and this was the AAA triad. Now, my question to you is, what do you think AAA stands for? Well, you'd be correct. It stands for availability, availability, availability. Yes, what we're trying to do this whole time, regardless of what configuration, we're just trying to keep the boat afloat, folks. That's all we're trying to do, trying to keep uptime at those five nines that you often hear about. Which leads me to this, how did I get the name Rainmaker? Um, it, first off, I don't believe that hacker handles should be picked. You shouldn't pick out your cool handle. I think that these names should be bequeathed upon you. And so uh, I'm not doing the whole cash, cash, money, money stuff that you often think of when you hear rainmaking. Uh, I look at it like um, being in there to you know do a miracle, if you may. Uh, in the circumstance where I got the name Rainmaker, we were doing a data center migration and our uh, connection to our data centers uh, ceased to, to exist. And some way, lo and behold, I was able to get that uh, connection back up. If you ask me why or how, I couldn't tell you. Um, but from then and that day forward, my boss started calling me Rainmaker. So again, the name stuck. So let's get started with our first of our confessions. At one time, I worked for a large uh, restaurant in, uh, organization. They had a bunch of different chains and different concepts. And as part of a retail restaurant uh, uh, company, uh, we had to have multiple networks. So you have to have your back of the house network. You have to have where the managers do their functions. You have the front of the house point of sale network, where again, all your point of sale machines are communicating with each other. Uh, and then lastly, you have your public facing free Wi-Fi if you choose to provide that. Uh, in this circumstance where we were doing a grand opening, uh, all the hardware comes in about a week before. So we have to do this huge, massive uh, push to get the IT operational right before the grand opening. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't given all the necessary network equipment uh, to get the entire system uh, up to spec, right? So, uh, unfortunately, I was mandated, against my better judgment, to make everything on a flat network. So, backup house, point of sale, even the front of the house was all on an open network. Anybody could dial in, anybody could get access to that network, and it was scary, right? And I, subsequently, I ended up leaving the organization due to situations like this. And I won't say where or who this organization was, but if you still go to those restaurants, or that restaurant, you'll probably find that that network is still flat. So, Which, again, kind of leads me to this point here, and I think this uh, picture here really personifies this. And this is something that I tell all my clients quite often. Any security control that inhibits the ability to do one's job is a security control that's going to be circumvented. So that leads me to the next set of stories. Now, if you haven't seen Altbeer's uh, DC, uh, I'm sorry, B-Sides DFW badge, it is awesome. It's the Cyber Dolphin from Johnny Mnemonic. And so that's really what the rest of this presentation is, is going to be mnemonic devices that will help me tell stories of uh, my misfortune and others. So the first one is World of Warcraft. What the heck? Well, this was in August of 2004 when I was working the night shift uh, as that help desk support person. And this is back when Molten Core 40 man raids were rocking. Uh, I was dual boxing my Resto Shaman and my uh, Prop Warrior with 38 other people. And I was doing that late at night. 
at the same time as I was working. So I was bringing my laptop in and raid leading. Um, that was bad. You know, you shouldn't bring foreign assets into a corporate network. But what we're seeing now is the exact opposite. In order, machines are so locked down now that many people have struggled to do their day-to-day -day functions. And what you're seeing is data is being exfiltrated by the employees to personal assets so that they can actually do their jobs. Now, this is a big no-no, folks. We definitely don't want our data to leave the controls of our organization, but that's what's happening nowadays. Now, the next story I wanna tell you is about content filtering, all right? So imagine this, you go to your, uh, your, your office, you happen to go into some inappropriate websites, and it gives you the website block, right? Everybody has those. Well, in certain circumstances, you need to go to websites that are unfortunately blocked. Maybe they're cryptocurrency sites or something like that. Um, but just due to an aggressive policy, the, this web content is blocked. So most organizations will allow outbound uh, communication via port 22. I mean, we got to access our AWS instances, right? So what I ended up doing was instantiating a, a, pro a SOX proxy. So I just SSH'd into my uh, Raspberry Pi back at home and made a few configuration settings on my web browser. And by doing that, you can completely bypass your organization's content monitoring filtering. So that's uh, another thing. Do as I say, not as I do, right? Now, the next one is about multi-factor authentication. I have a terrible memory. I, it's just, it's bad. I have a hard time remembering names and faces and losing my keys and my wallet. And quite often I would forget my multi-factor token uh, when I was going to work. Um, unfortunately, you'd have to access the PCI network uh, through multi-factor authentication. Well, what I was also at the time was the uh, virtualization um, person. So I ran in the EXX, ESXi hosts and our vSphere uh, implementation. So by jumping into the uh, machines via console access on VMware, I was able to completely bypass any sort of multi-factor authentication. So think about it this way, folks. If you're protecting these assets aggressively, make sure you're protecting the virtualization just as aggressively because that's an easy way to pivot from within the virtualization infrastructure into those VMs. So be wary of virtualization. Now, the next one is, does anybody see what's wrong with this particular uh, picture here? Somebody just happened to walk away from the computer leaving it completely unattended. And this is something that we saw all the time back when we worked in an office facility. Um, this is where I wanted to introduce uh, the donut concept. This is a great, great opportunity to gamify security within an organization. Here's what you do. You set up a distribution list called donut at your organization. Now, if you happen to walk away from your machine, for example, uh, somebody might stumble upon your computer, open it up an email to donut at your organization. And unfortunately, you're now obligated to bring donuts in the next morning. So like I said, this is a great way to gamify your security and have a little fun. And at the end of the day, be more secure. Now, the next thing is a, a forest and it's, and tripping over a wire. What, what is this? Well, at the time I was responsible for monitoring the integrity of all of our point of sale systems. There's a great, great tool called Tripwire that monitors every single change, every, um, every tweak on a, uh, on a machine and reports back to the, to the administrators as the change of integrity of the system. Um, when you're doing this on a global level, you've got you know thousands of thousands of endpoints that change configurations ever so slightly on the daily. And so we were having hundreds, if not thousands of alerts coming in on the daily. And for a single person to manage that who was in, in, improperly trained, no less, um, I figured out a way to automate this and really make it easy for me. So as all these alerts were coming into my email, I created this rule that deleted them all. <laughs> yeah, so it really didn't accomplish a whole lot. And so often what you see here is, is that you can't see the forest through the trees. You have to tune and tailor your alerts so that you're not inundated with enough alerts that you don't no longer see the actual alerts coming in that are of real value. So again, filter your alerts because it will save you a lot of hassle in the end. 
Now, I'm going to share with you a video here that is a mistake that, as a systems administrator, I made all the time. Open the file. So this is a 6.0 version. You didn't upgrade yet, did you, Genius? Know the, who this is? This is Just old, use a translation old Saturday Night Live and Jimmy Fallon. Where's that? Move. Playing, uh, <laughs> go to your chooser. Every go to the printer. Pick your zone and goes, pick your printer. Move. Hold on, I'm on the chooser. It makes everybody okay. get up. Is this the zone here? Okay. Move. There you go. Move. <laughs> So we have, uh, All right, let's Nick run a test. Just type in X Y dot and again, uh, violator slash four six seven four six. Like, what? Type in Move. Move. <laughs> so what? Companies By logging onto a machine with his credentials, he was essentially in putting his NTLM hash in memory of those machines. So the better practice here is to uh, reboot the machine after Nick logs on. That way it clears, his ca it clears the memory. And if the machine was compromised, well, the only hashes in that memory would be the person currently logged in and those service accounts. So again, Nick should have said move, totally fine, logged off, rebooted the machine, and handed this system back. All right, so what do we have here in this next slide? We have this mountain of trash and passwords. So what we see here is, is quite often people are recycling their passwords in the wrong way. We see password reuse over and over and over again. In fact, did you know that when Disney Plus was released, that very day there were accounts that were available for purchase on the dark web? Why was Disney Plus hacked? Absolutely not. People were using the same passwords over and over and over again, even the same passwords that were leaked in a data breach. So again, this demonstrates why password reuse is so bad. But we also see password reuse in, in other methods. Uh, the first one here is Tux here holding the Windows logo. This tells me uh, a story I want to share with you about password reuse. One of my clients happened to have a service account password that was on their Windows environments. They were using it also to interactively log on as systems administrators. They were also using it again like as a service account, as a database account. Uh, the same credential was also used in their network infrastructure and their Linux environment. They weren't even AD bridged and they were still using these same credentials. So what would happen if they were required to rotate the passwords? Well, they honestly didn't know where the passwords were being used. They didn't know what applications would break in the circumstance of the credential change. So what did they do? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. They didn't rotate the password. So in the event that it was compromised, they, a single bad actor could basically pivot across the entire organization and multiple platforms. Now, our next story, I think this one is hilarious. This is Kangaroo Jack. This is the uh, avatar of the gentleman that was working as a Linux systems administrator next to me. Super smart guy, and uh, this story is hilarious. So, Audit required us to rotate the Linux passwords every 90 days. Now, if you're familiar with a large enterprise organization, there's a significant amount of Linux infrastructure. Um, to rotate those passwords every 90 days manually was a huge challenge. So we found out this, uh, we use this application called Dish that would allow us to dish out multiple commands to multiple endpoints at the same time. So what we would do is go in to the dish out the password change to the entire Linux infrastructure, changing the password, thus breaking all the applications, the service accounts, you name it. But what he did was he immediately dished out that same command to re rotate the passwords back to the original. So essentially, if you look at the last date of the password change, it's, it's compliant. Audit's happy, but in reality, the password never changed. So yes, we don't want to, uh, we want to use our passwords correctly. Don't reuse them over and over and over again. Uh, passwords should really be one of, or not one of three things, three of three things. Complex, unique, and the most often neglected, frequently rotating. Because think about it like this. It takes 57 days to basically brute force an eight character complex password. If you have a policy that rotates the password every seven days or so, that password's been changed multiple times over by the time that that initial password was cracked. Which leads me to this point. 
I, when it comes to compliance, compliance is a good thing. It allows an organization to have that carrot on a stick that it pushes them to be more proactive with their security measures. But what you see here is, is that often compliance is the low watermark. It, it turns into the minimum viable product. So in my opinion, a lot of organizations view uh, compliance uh, not seriously. Um, so if you want to find an organization uh, that does take security seriously and you want to learn more, uh, I would highly recommend you follow my friend, Hermit Hacker. Brian Mork is an amazing resource and he's the type of person that personifies uh, real security. So if you want to learn more, check out Hermit. So. You've seen me on some of my confessions. I absolutely have uh, shared with you some of my, 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 my dark secret confessions. Uh, you're, I've seen terrible things, again, throughout my career and viewing the mistakes of my clients and, and, and coworkers. Um, here's one that I, 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 it's not my coworker, but I wanna show you uh, a, a video and I want you to tell me where the mistake So happened. the flyest, right, freshest, most here, amazing car. And, and what we wanna start his, with uh, is, one, uh, I, I, so I, I, brought a, I brought doing. a gift with me right here. Um, Anybody see what happened there? This right here Hold on. is we'll let the, the iPlane One. I'll show you this again in slow mo. Right. Oh, what did Kanye gosh. do? His password uh, is zero 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 zero. Right yes. here. He has a very um, weak default password, which leads me to this: don't have weak passwords. Don't use the built-in administrator passwords. These sorts of things literally blow my mind every time I see them. Which leads me to Guilfoyle here. If you haven't seen Silicon Valley, I highly, highly recommend you watch this show. It is amazing. I love this quote. If you're dumb enough to leave your login on a post-it on your desk, it's not a hack. It's barely social engineering. It's more like natural selection. Which allows me to show you this. Over the course of my adventures visiting all sorts of clients, uh, I've seen a lot of exposed passwords just out in the open. So again, don't do this. People and pen testers and bad actors will absolutely go to the office facilities and harvest these sorts of passwords. Don't get smart and leave them under your keyboard because that's probably one of the first places people will look. Which leads me to this point. If you're ever going to be interviewed, if you're ever going to be on TV, if you're ever going to be having some media attention, don't have that in your office because quite often, Passwords are, again, exposed in broad daylight. And these are all media interviews in which passwords were clearly exposed, uh, leading to actual data breaches. So, uh, which leads me to this. In the future, what you're going to find is less vulnerabilities, less exploits, and more misconfigurations. I like this quote from Gartner. Uh, by 2023, 99% of cloud security failures will not be due to vulnerabilities, but due to misconfigurations on the client part. We just saw that recently with a huge financial institution had a major data breach simply due to a misconfiguration of their WAF firewall rules. Um, basically, the rule um, allowed for uh, reading of AWS buckets when they had no business doing so. Um, and again, this is just misconfigurations, over-provisioning, and that sort of stuff. Uh, another thing that we see is hard-coded credentials in source code within scripts. And so I wanted to show you a tool called Trufflehog, which searches for strings of entropy in GitHub repos. Now, it not only does that, but it also looks at the commit history. So even if you remove the source code, or remove the credential from the source code, if you didn't remove it from the commit history uh, as well, well, bad actors are gonna find it. So let's take a look at my recorded demo here where we're looking at this idiot's uh, GitHub repo. And oh my God, look at all the SSH keys, the private keys that are available here. Uh, this happens to be my own GitHub repo, so no harm, no foul. But again, it finds API keys, passwords, uh, SSH keys, you name it. So any string of entropy, Trufflehog can sniff out. And so that's just one of many other different tools that are available to you, free and open source. Which leads me to my uh, next story here, Mr. T. I love Mr. T. I had a little Mr. T doll when I was about six years old. And uh, this is a story of uh, intrigue and uh, being laid off. Yes, as part of uh, my career, I almost was laid off and uh, 
Unfortunately, I had survivor's guilt because the large number of our uh, e-commerce team, our IT, IT team were outsourced to an MSP. And uh, our e-commerce team, one of the gentlemen, did not take very kindly to being laid off. So what he did was plant a logic bomb. Tick, tick, boom. At some point in time, this code would execute and launch its payload. So what happened was on April 1st, I uh, can't remember which year, but basically this was long time past this guy leaving the organization. The logic bomb went off. It basically manipulated a JavaScript code on the front facing corporate, uh, inter uh, the retail site. Basically it flipped the entire website upside down. Now everybody in the inside was panicking going, what the hell happened? Well, in reality, it was just a very simple JavaScript. Security found it, but until then, they were running around with the chicken like their heads cut off. Um, PR played it perfectly. They put, because it was April 1st, they played it off as an April Fool's joke. No one was the wiser until now. Now you know. Now, the next story I'm going to tell you is about a gentleman that... Uh, uh, you're going to love this one. So uh, as part of my job previously, I would go and do assessments for organizations. And uh, as part of the assessment, we would find highly privileged accounts, service accounts, um, sysadmin accounts that are running services, which is like a big, big no-no. Because simply put, if that service account is running, then that's the account that's running that service, that hash is in memory. So if you use like, I don't know, a domain admin um, that, norm, uh, that would log on and do that, well, that domain admin is in the memory uh, as long as that service is running. So I found this and I reported this back and I didn't realize that that same gentleman uh, happened to be in the room with me. And uh, I'm going to quote this and again, plug your ears. It's not that I'm calling you a liar, but I don't believe a word you just fucking said. Now that will put you... Uh, on your heels very quickly, right? Uh, I didn't know what to do. So the first thing I did was grab the HDMI cable, plug it in, we RDP'd into the box, and lo and behold, guess who's running Procmon? <laughs> I have never seen a man turn that red, that fast, that quickly. Uh, it, it really vindicated me. But again, it just goes to demonstrate that, you know, we need to make sure that we're not interactively logging in and using service accounts simultaneously. It allows for your, uh, your incident response team, your SOC to determine uh, how an account is properly used and when it's not being properly used. Now, this is a good story about porno surfing or surfing for inappropriate content. There was a gentleman where I worked that uh, worked the night shift and had a uh, propensity for uh, not appropriate content. Um, what this person would do was save some movies and images to their local machine, their My Documents, and didn't realize that the documents were also being synced to our SAN uh, back at HQ. Now, we stopped replicating that a few years back, but um, it was my job to clean up the SAN and kind of remove and archive some of the data. Uh, upon that, I stumbled upon his treasure trove of naughty bits, and uh, we had to report it to HR. Now, this gentleman did not take too kindly to that, they accused me of planting it on him uh, so that he would get fired. So I got very, very clever. I said, hey, you've been here longer than I have, right? All right, well, why don't we do this? Let's go pick a backup. You just pick any date, any date before I started, okay? And we'll see what happens. And so we restored the backup and lo and behold, um, yeah, his backup <laughs> retrieved a bunch of naughty stuff. Now, I'm not trying to kink shame anybody. What you do on your own time is your own business. It's, it's not ours. But don't do that on a corporate machine, folks. That's definitely a big no-no. Which leads me to my next point. There are certain words and phrases that we really need to refrain from using with dealing with people within our own teams, people outside of our teams, and I'm just going to go through a handful of them. The first one is ping. Now this one's a little weak, but a ping is a ICMP request beacon waiting for a beacon response. And that's the technical term. It originated from sonar. Um, it's not to reach out to somebody and, you know, hey, I'm pinging you for this, uh, hit me back later. Uh, it's a little confusing to people outside of the uh, military and outside of IT. Uh, the next phrase I think applies to everyone. Uh, to be honest, right? That implies at times that you're not honest. So just do yourself a favor and just drop this from your vernacular, okay? 
The next one I want to share with you is burning the ships. This is to denote, you know, marking a line in the sand that you just can't go past, you know, or you can't go back from. Uh, back in the day, the conquistadors of yesteryear would finally make it to the new world and wouldn't have enough resources to, to uh, ship back to where they came from. So there's stories that the conquistadors would burn their ships so their uh, crew would know that they couldn't go back. Well, one, they didn't do that. Two, if they did, that would be really stupid, right? What they did instead of burning the ships was actually scuttling the ships. Think about how much natural, not natural, but how many resources would be available to, as a ship. The lumber, the canvas, there's so much that would be available to these conquistadors and these sailors. So again, it's not about burning the ships and moving forward. It's about doing that in a responsible way. So again, no burning ships. Now, the last one really chaps me. I hate this term. This is something, uh, opening the kimono was a term that really uh, started in the late 80s and um, early 90s. Uh, it's to denote uh, pure transparency, opening one's kimono to expose themselves. And, and in my opinion, this is not only racist, but also sexist. So uh, just drop this entirely. Just don't use this word. And if you hear people that are using this, Take them aside and let them know that this is just not acceptable. So thank you. Do yourself a favor. No opening the kimono. Last but not least, I hate the term hacking when we're talking about the context of cybercrime. Hacking is not a crime, folks. It's not. Bruce Schneier defines hacking as using something outside of its intended use. It's how and what you hack that determines whether it's good or bad. Also, the, the stereotype of the hacker with the hoodie and the Guy Fox mask living in their mom's basement or whatever. These are just stereotypes. You want to see what a hacker looks like? Well, it's, it's you. It's me. Look in the mirror, folks. That's a hacker, right? It's not the guy in the hoodie, okay? Um, so, I've shared with you some of the terrible things that I've seen. I've often seen some really good things over the course of my career. The first is a really quick and easy way to protect yourself from ransomware. Let's face it, uh, Joan in accounting, uh, my grandmother, there's no reason why they need to be opening up PowerShell scripts. There's no reason why they should be uh, running batch files or VBS scripts. So by associating them with WordPad instead of the, uh, the, the actual engine, uh, that will stop these malicious payloads from executing. It's a very quick and easy way to protect your organization. Also, if you notice right there, there is an Easter egg. So I highly encourage you to check it out. All right, the next thing is uh, just a very simple change when you're installing software. Uh, have that secondary data drive that you can change the install path because quite often script kitty tools are looking for a default installation of C program files, x86, blah, 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 blah. So by changing the destination of where the software is installed, it makes that job for a, a, an attacker that much more difficult. And it also has an operational benefit as well. What it will do is shrink the size of your incremental backups considerably. So not only is this a more secure uh, course of action, but it's an operationally sound as well. So as you can see, I've had a lot of fun over the course of my, oh gosh, 20-something years in the industry. Uh, we've got Jason Street and his awkward hug. I've got some time, uh, the spaghetti time when I was working with the government, and I've made some amazing friends. Um, this is another fun thing for April, no, it was June 17th. Uh, if anybody has watched American Psycho, I changed all the time clocks uh, globally to say feed me a stray cat. So uh, you can have fun on the job too. So. One of the things I want to share with you is that shitty sysadmins make the best security professionals because we know where the bodies are buried. We've made these mistakes and we know how to correct them, which leads me to this. There's a common question that I get from a lot of people starting out in the industry, um, whether or not they should, what, what they can do to get their foot in the door. And it leads me to this, the concept of experience versus certification. Uh, if you don't have experience, certification will help you a long way. Does anybody know who this person is? This is Dave Ramsey. 
Dave Ramsey is a financial guru. He teaches a class called Financial Peace University. And I owe a lot to Dave as he helped me get out of debt. Uh, I had like $35,000 in debt at one point due to credit cards. And uh, following his what we call debt snowball, uh, it really allowed me to basically become debt free very, very quickly. So his concept of uh, starting off with the smallest, building upon that, building upon that until you have a giant snowball of, of, of whatever, we're gonna take that and apply that to certifications. So from a blue team perspective, from a defensive, we start at the basics, you know, just learning the fundamentals of IT. That's where the CompTIA Plus leads to the Security Plus, which then leads to the SSCP, or GIAC has a really good uh, GSEC course that I find uh, falls in this line with this, uh, with this stage. But once you've accomplished the GSEC or the SSCP, you basically got five of the eight modules that are really necessary for the CISSP. That's the... Uh, Anyway, th from e that's like the, I don't know, master's degree of cybersecurity. Um, but even then, you can go forward and, and specialize between uh, healthcare, cloud, you name it. Um, all of these basically allow you to become the cyber warrior that you, you're trying to achieve. Um, the same thing can be done on the red side as well. So starting out with this certified ethical hacker leading to the, uh, the what is it, SEC 561, I think, uh, the G-SPEN. Um, also, that leads to the OSCP, which then, again, you can specialize by going into the OSCE, whatever, and at that point, you're a dark wizard. Now, this leads me to this. Certifications are only as good as the paper that they're printed on. You really have to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. You, otherwise, you're just wasting your time with these brain dumps and certification boot camps. So really understand what you're learning, because otherwise, you're just cheating yourself. Now. This typically is meant to be a live presentation where I would then walk around the crowd and say, hey, oh, it's your opportunity to share your stories and confessions. But since we didn't have that here today, I'm going to share with you a couple of confessions that were shared with me from the uh, B-Sides DFW community. Uh, the first one is this one. Does anybody know what Uname S does on a Linux system? Well, it's fairly simple. It checks the machine name properties of a remote server. But what does that same command do on a Solaris system? Anybody know? Well, it happens to rename the host. Yeah, imagine doing that on a DNS server. You're going to mess things up real quick and it will be a bad time. So know what commands are what on each operating system. Now, how many people here have ever done this? Yes. I, yeah, there we go. So I know some people have done this. I have done this. It's a mistake and we've all made it. So a quick thing that I would recommend you to do is edit your dot profile to rm-i. Basically what this does is prompts you to confirm your deletions. That way you're not making huge errors like this, right? Now, this one, we were just talking about this downstairs. Um, a gentleman, I'm going to not use his name, was working for an MSP that, uh, maintain several different clients. This was back in like the late 90s, early 2000s maybe. And basically, uh, he got smart and said, oh, I'm going to make this a, a file that I can easily access from anywhere. Um, so what he did was he put the passwords on a, a GeoCities website. <laughs> and all the usernames, phone numbers, passwords, root access into these systems. Now, he was smart. He didn't link it to anything. So, you know, hopefully spiders and search engines wouldn't find it. But you know who did find it? Wayback Machine. Yes, it archived that page with all the credentials and usernames and passwords, you name it. So, yeah, that's uh, not cool, right? <laughs> so, the next one is uh, from uh, uh, Ben Goers from uh, Fuzzy Snuggly Duck, I think is the name. They're awesome team. Uh, this is a story that he shared with me of a, of a situation. He didn't make this, but this is a story of a hacker. or Not a hacker, a bad actor, a criminal. So, what happened is this database... This database was exfiltrated by this bad actor. But not only was the database uh, stolen, uh, he actually compromised, or they compromised the database by injecting their own email address into that database. So what happened a few months later is InfoSec finally found uh, evidence of a data breach and uh, alerted all the users in that database. Say, hey, your information's been compromised. We've already taken care of it, blah, 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 blah. Well, that also notified our bad actor here. Not cool. Well, you'd think the story ends there, right? No. This is where the bad actor decided to take a step forward and use that 
to fish the employees again. It's basically saying, hey, we know your data was compromised. We've created the secondary portal. If you wanna get paid, go log on here. And basically that's how this malicious actor was not only able to compromise the database, but also fish everybody to hell. So yeah. So we're getting close to the end of my presentation, folks. I told you there was going to be a quiz later. So let's see, does anybody remember what SLA stands for? Yes, service level agreement. FCR, what was FCR? First call resolution. All right, now the big one here, the CIA triad. Does anybody remember what that stood for? Confidentiality, integrity, availability, that's right. But what is the AAA triad of, of, of systems administration? That's right, it's availability, availability, availability. And last but not least, I just needed that in here, so. Anyway, again, the takeaways from today's presentations are pretty simple. Uh, specifically, prioritize security. Uh, any control that's inhibiting the ability to do your job is going to be circumvented. So don't cut corners. Make sure that the people that you're entrusting to enforce these rules are actually doing the same themselves. Also, just remember, that in the future, um, the future is now, folks, that you're going to find the case more often than not that there will be breaches due to misconfigurations versus actual traditional exploits and vulnerabilities. They're still there, but you're going to find more misconfigurations as the entry point versus anything else. And just understand, systems administrators, we're people too. We make mistakes, and it's just part of life. So, a takeaway from today is understand that there is risk everywhere, especially even as a systems administrator. Uh, learn from the mistakes of myself, learn from the mistakes of my friends and coworkers, and, and don't let this happen to you. Oh, I almost forgot the three envelope rule. Again, I told you that Sean basically saved my career after he passed away. He said, whenever there is the, the shit hits the fan, you don't know what to do, everything is turned upside down and you don't know what to do, go to this file cabinet and grab an envelope. And trust me, it will save your job. So after he passed, our database went down that was holding our uh, timekeeping software. So uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I, was out of, I was out of luck. I was at my wit's end. So I went to the file cabinet. I opened up the envelope and what it said was, blame the previous sysadmin. So that's what I did. I blamed it on Sean. I said, hey, this was his fault. I'm so sorry. I'll get this operational. And I finally got it operational. But that saved my job. Now, about six months later, um, another system went down. I think this was our SAP system or our digital asset management system. For the sake of the story, it doesn't really matter. But the point is, is it went down hard. And I'm scrambling, trying to keep my head above water. I couldn't do it. So I went back to that file cabinet. You know what it said when I opened up that envelope? Blame the vendor. So again, that's exactly what I did. I said, hey, look, it's the vendor's fault. It's a problem. I'll work with them. Just deal with it. We'll get this up eventually. And you know what? It worked. It totally worked. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. Now, again, several months went by and another system went down. Again, for the sake of our story, I can't remember what it was. But again, the shit had hit, had hit the fan. I didn't know what to do. So I went back to that file cabinet as my last resort I opened up that envelope and you know what it said? Prepare three envelopes. That concludes my talk today, folks. I really appreciate your time and enjoy the rest of B-Sides DFW. Thank you.